For the West, though, it still leaves important questions unanswered. The government has announced a 14-day ban on flights in or out of Britain by the Soviet airline Aeroflot, beginning on Thursday. The action is expected to be followed by other NATO countries. Thompson Holidays, who use Aeroflot for their summer package tours, have cancelled all holidays to Russia until September the 28th. American jet fighters have flown over Lebanon again today, out on reconnaissance to pinpoint gun positions after more shelling. And there's been yet another report of a massacre, the Christian radio blaming Druze fighters for killing over 60 villagers. But the Druze deny the allegation. Six British buccaneer aircraft are now in Akrotiri in Cyprus to give support to the British troops in Beirut. Neil Bennett reports. The presence of the Buccaneer fighter bombers, just 15 minutes flying time from Beirut, is meant to reassure the British troops in the peacekeeping force. They carry air-to-ground missiles and bombs and are more than capable of silencing the guns which have been terrorising the Lebanese capital from positions in the mountains overlooking it. The men who will be supporting the ground forces are from 208 and 12 squadrons. It's only 24 hours since they arrived from the wind and driving rain of RAF Lossiemouth to operate in the clear blue but potentially hazardous skies of the Middle East. Today the crews were airborne for the first time since their arrival at Akrotiri, carrying out training manoeuvres and generally familiarising themselves with the area they'll be working in. They're glad to be able to offer real and vital support to British soldiers involved in a difficult operation, but their political masters will be hoping they never have to fly in anger. The Buccaneers are here as a show of strength to demonstrate to anybody who might be tempted to attack the British contingent in Beirut that extra muscle is now close at hand, poised to hit back. The logistical build-up has been going on at the base for some time. Giant Chinook helicopters have already been flown in, in case supplies need to be airlifted into Beirut. They've been practicing lifting the ferret scout cars in which British troops patrol their sector of the city. For RAF Akrotiri, the latest crisis in Lebanon has brought a sudden surge of activity. There's now a real possibility that instead of its usual air-sea rescue helicopters, the base could soon be handling combat missions. Up until now, the British contingent of the multinational force has been more lightly armed than any of the other three nations which make up the force. Just machine guns to defend their base in the southern suburbs of Beirut, and the Browning guns mounted on their ferret scout cars. For artillery, the 97 British troops have had to rely on the Americans based around the airport, and for air support on American and French jet fighters based on the carriers lying off Beirut. Now, like the Americans and the French, they have their own air cover, and they're delighted. You know, when it came to the crunch, well, and it hasn't come to the crunch at all, but we knew that, uh, that our people back there would, uh, would be planning this sort of thing, and no way would they let us down. I mean, we knew it would happen. We didn't have any definite information yesterday, but uh, now it's happened, well, it's something that we'd, we'd expect to happen. The American jets which flew over Beirut for the third time this week were F-14s from the aircraft carrier Eisenhower. Their job was to report back the position of guns that had been shelling Lebanese army positions. Two white Air Force officers deported from Zimbabwe are now in Britain and have expressed concern for their four colleagues still detained after being cleared of sabotage. Air Vice Marshal Hugh Slatter said goodbye to his wife Jane in Harare last night, hoping to be reunited soon. Air Commodore Philip Pyle left behind his wife Liz and two sons. Both men will stay in Britain for the time being. The release of the two men followed a week of intensive negotiations by diplomats and lawyers. After flying through the night, they arrived at Gatwick at half past seven this morning, their future still uncertain. Because of the delicacy of negotiations over the four other Air Force officers still being held in Zimbabwe, they wouldn't answer questions, but confined their remarks to a brief expression of concern over the fate of their colleagues. I'd like to express our gratitude and appreciation for the concern and interest that has been shown over our situation and that continues to be shown over our situation. For our part of this time, we are concerned for the predicament of our fellow officers who are left behind. But I hope that their situation also will be resolved very soon.
I would hope now that I will be able to get together with my family once again and uh, start things afresh for myself and them. In Belfast, seven Republicans have appeared before magistrates charged with serious terrorist offences. The charges are based on information from the latest IRA supergrass, Robert Lean. James Robbins was in court. Six of the seven men were charged with being members of the provisional IRA. One faces a charge of attempting to murder an army corporal, others of conspiracy to murder, and in one case, conspiracy to imprison unlawfully Mrs. Fiona Brown, the wife of an IRA informer. He retracted his evidence before she reappeared safe in West Belfast. A detective sergeant told the court that most of the charges were based solely on information from the latest IRA supergrass, Robert Lean, and confirmed that Lean had been granted immunity from prosecution. All seven in the dock denied all the charges. Defence solicitors complained to the magistrate about coverage of the arrest by the news media and said press statements based on malicious police leaks about their clients had prejudiced any future trial. The magistrate said he would consider the matter and remanded all seven men in custody to appear again on Tuesday. A stunt driver has been seriously hurt in an accident at the Santa Pod racetrack near Northampton. The accident was seen live by millions of viewers of the BBC One programme, The Noel Edmonds Late Late Breakfast Show. The details from Peter Gould. The accident happened during an attempt to break the record for the longest car jump, which stands at 232 feet. A professional stunt driver, Rich Smith, approached the takeoff ramp at a speed of around 100 miles an hour. The car virtually disintegrated in the crash and Mr. Smith was left lying in the debris on the track. His wife and children had been among spectators watching the record attempt, which was also seen live by millions of television viewers. <sighs> Mr. Smith was conscious when he reached hospital and he's now being treated for injuries to his head, neck and back. His condition is said to be fair. Now, news of today's sport, beginning with the team at the top of the Cannon League. Here's David Cass. West Ham stayed firmly on the top of the league thanks largely to a hat-trick by Dave Swindlehurst. The Hammers demolished Coventry in a five-minute spell halfway through the first period. But earlier it looked like being their unlucky day. Ray Stewart could have opened the scoring for West Ham but for an impressive save by 17-year-old Perry Suckling. West Ham's defenders just watched as Phil Parks saved and then Trevor Peake scored. Unexpectedly, Coventry continued to win possession. A good run by Terry Gibson and Nicky Platnow put the visitors 2-0 ahead. Then began West Ham's fight back. A goal set up by Tony Cotty for Dave Swindle. England's manager, Bobby Robson, was at Upton Park to watch Devonshire and Martin. But it was Trevor Brooking whose calmness and vision, along with Cotty's running, turned the game. Steve Whitten scored the equaliser against his old club. Swindlehurst had put the hammers ahead, and by the second half the outcome was never in doubt especially after Witten's outstanding second goal. West Ham led 4-2. England hopeful Alan Devonshire set up the hat-trick for Swindlehurst with a little help from the tireless Brookings header. Final score, West Ham 5, Coventry 2. And West Ham are two points clear of Ipswich, who beat Stoke 5-0. Manchester United beat Luton 2-0, Liverpool won by the same score at Highbury, so did Southampton at Sunderland. Simon Garner got all of Blackburn Rovers five goals but beat Derby, and Tony Coldwell of Bolton Wanderers also got five as his side beat Walsall 8-1. In Scotland, Dundee United and Celtic got five goals each in beating Hibbs and St Johnston. Hearts beat Rangers and Aberdeen drew at Motherwell. John Lever may have bowled Essex to the Schweppes Championship title today. He took seven wickets against bottom of the table Yorkshire, who were all out for 204. It gave Essex four crucial bonus points, while Middlesex were all but washed out. Mark Austin reports. 
Keith Fletcher put Yorkshire in and Jeff Boycott soon found the lively Chelmsford wicket living up to its reputation. At the other end, Moxon was having his problems. And when Moxon was on 23, Gooch made an uncharacteristic slip, putting down the only chance of the morning. After lunch, Boycott went for 37. The victim of a pitch rather than the bowler, the ball from John Lever kept cruelly low. In his next over, Lever had sharp caught with one that lifted, Gooch holding on to this one. Another flyer from Lever and Moxon went...